This is Damian Macy, Friends of the Marshall Public Library, and I'm working on our oral history project. It is Tuesday, July the 21st, 2015, and I'm at the lovely home of Beth Mackey at 808 North 8th Street here in Marshall. Uh, Beth is not originally from Marshall, but she's been a resident for many years, a teacher, and this is probably going to be the only interview with a doctor's wife. And with that, I'll introduce you to Beth, who's also been a teacher in the local system. Beth, you're on. Thank you. Um, first of all, it's an honor to do this. Um, uh, I, I guess I'll start with um, where I was born. I was born in Flora, Illinois, which is in Clay County in Illinois. And I lived in Stewartson, which is... Um, in Shelby County. Um, Effingham would have been the closest hospital, but the hospital, if you recall, like in the late 40s, burned to the ground. Yeah. And, um, such a tragedy. And so my older brother and I were both born in Florida. They sent the ladies to deliver in all the area hospitals. So my mother got Flora, um, but by the time my sister was born, the hospital had been rebuilt. Um, my Father and mother both came from Beecher City, Illinois, um, Effingham County. My dad grew up on a farm, but became a banker, um, an insurance agent. He, um, before that, he had worked at Nord, um, but he was president of the Stewartson National Bank and then Prairie National Bank um, when it changed names. My mother taught school in a one-room schoolhouse and then... Um, went back to Eastern and got her degree and got her master's from um, U of I. I was the second of four. I have an older brother, younger sister and brother. Um, my Everybody kind of still lives in the area. Uh, what were your parents' names? Uh, my father, Ray Richards, and my mother, Florence Smith Richards. So, um, very common name. Um, my father passed away in well, they were both born in 1923. My father passed away in 2006, and my mother's still living, so she's almost 92. Just took another Wonderful. couple months. Um, I guess when I was in high school, um, I worked at a little place called Lake Paul Custard Stand. The mayor of the town was our neighbor, and he had a little custard stand, like a Dairy Queen, had a pond, and that's when fishing was the big thing. People would come... We would sell bait, but we would fry hamburgers and do ice cream, and we would work from noon until 10 o'clock at night and get 50 cents an hour, $5 for the evening. On 4th of July, we got $10. Uh, and they told us when we first started working, my older brother had worked there, and we turned 16. He got a, another job, and so my sister and I worked, and they said, you can eat all you want, but after about two days, kind of that the thrill of that wore off. Um, did you actually have like a car hop service? No. Or was it, did they walk up to a window? They would walk serve? up to the window and then um, like a patio area. Okay. And the, the farmers would come in in the evening and everybody would get ice cream and, you know, drinks, pop, and sit around and visit for hours until it closed. Um, there was always one person who would come about quarter till ten when you cleaned the grill and they wanted a hamburger. But um, he, the owner, Paul Yankee, had a golf cart and he would let us drive it around the little pond like in the middle of the day when no one was there. You could kind of, we, he was kind of like a, a grandpa uncle, I guess. Um, so that was, a, that was a good memory. Did you end up do, excuse me, doing any cooking? or We did the hamburgers. Serving? We fried hamburgers. Um, no, and we... You know, wiped everything down at night, cleaned the grill, but they would come in at a little before ten, and they would always um, clean the machines. But my older brother, they even had him do that, and so my sister and I didn't have to. Um, so I graduated in 1971 from Stewartson Strasburg High School in a class of 44. My hometown was only 750 people, so to me, Marshall was a big city. Um, <laughs> When I was in high school, I, I think I enjoyed being involved. So cheerleading, National Honor Society, pep club, yearbook staff, newspaper staff, um, 
FBLA, just all kinds of things. Um, then I went to Eastern um, in the fall of 71, and at the time, Eastern was on quarters. And I pledged a sorority, um, Sigma Kappa, which that was such a good thing. I made a lot of lifelong friends there. Um, but when I was partway through, they switched at Eastern from quarters to semesters. Mm -hmm. So they had said if you were a freshman at the beginning, you would be fine on the switch. If you were almost to graduate, you would be fine. If you were in the middle, which is where I was, they couldn't guarantee you'd graduate on time. So several of my friends, we went to summer school, and we ended up graduating early, which <laughs> I guess that was still a good thing. What did you major in, education? Elementary education, mm -hmm. um, and with early childhood and... I wanted to teach kindergarten, and I did do that. Um, I finished student teaching in Champaign in kindergarten on a Friday, and that Monday I started teaching <laughs> third grade in Streeter, Illinois. So it was a, in December, so it was I was fortunate to get a job in the middle of the year. And I did, the concept was called Open Classroom. It was two third grades together with a folding door that they would pull back. It was a new school. And we would team teach part of the time. She would teach part. Mm -hmm. I would. We would share. Um, so it was just a whole new way to start. And it, it was great. At that um, When they were getting ready to do budget cuts, we were all afraid we were going to be cut. So I talked to a friend from um, near my hometown, and she said, well, come to the Peoria area. Look around, and, and we'll We'll work on some interviews. So I did have interviews and got a job in East Peoria and decided that sounded more fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and we they didn't do the budget cut, we thought. but Was the fact that the town was larger kind of oh, maybe it had been a draw at I that time? I think so. When you're 21 or 22, that sounded, you know, bigger city, more shopping. <laughs> I thought. Um, so when I went to my friend Paula's for the interview weekend, she had a blind date for me with Steve, and he was, she was a teacher, but was, they had a new baby, so she was home, and, and her husband was in medical school with Steve, and they were partners as they did rotations, so like they would both do pediatrics, and then they would both go to the next thing, so, so they had gotten to know each other, we went on the blind date, <laughs> and so that's kind of when I decided, you know, I will go ahead and move to East Peoria, not... And, and leave Streeter. And so was Steve in Peoria then at that time also? He was in medical school. And okay. we had both, though, gone to Eastern. But I would have been a freshman. He would have been a senior. He was probably in the science building, and I was far away from the <laughs> science Different building. Different directions, huh? Yeah. Um, so kind of we had things in common that we didn't know about. So uh, uh. we dated then while I was um, teaching and got engaged. And... Um, he graduated, I think it was like about June 4th, uh, from medical school, and it was, this ceremony was in Chicago, and we went to that, and then my sister got married on June 13th, wow. and we got married on June 19th, in 1976, so my parents had two weddings in one week. Same church, um, <laughs> I, it, at the time it didn't seem like that would have been a lot of to do, but that was probably a lot <laughs> for yes. my parents. Well, when you come around to anniversary times, then they kind of fall right together, too. Don't yes, you? they did. Um, she lost her husband this hmm. in November, but we were just a year apart in school, so we were we've stayed like best of friends. Um, so when we got married, then Steve was ready to start his residency in Rockford. Um, it was all through the U of I, and I got a job in Belvedere. Okay. teaching kindergarten, and oh, I forgot to mention, when I was in East Peoria, my kindergarten classes, one section in, had 36 and one 37, so it was half day each, and they were very well behaved. It was oh, it was a wonderful experience. But, yeah, well, then, then I in Belvedere, and that was, was really fun, too, and that was kindergarten. And then when our son was born in January of 78, Chris... Um, then <laughs> it was one of the worst winters, the winter of 77, 78, and 79. The following February, 
in 79, our daughter Megan was born. So those were probably two of the worst winters. <laughs> um, I remember Steve's mom would write or call, and she'd say, well, the kids went to school one day this week. This was um, in Marshall. And uh, my mom was still teaching, and she <laughs> came up to stay when Chris was born. And she was snowed in at our house for two weeks, but only missed like four days of school. Oh. <laughs> so, it, uh, But my dad had take brought her up so he could meet Chris and then he went back home and he couldn't come back and get her. He sure. would say he could get to Decatur and then he had to turn around and go yeah. back. So in the end he followed the snow plow. Well the weather was just dreadful here. Oh it was. But I know 200 miles farther north or 225 or 230 it had to be worse. I think my mom would say she would look at the paper, and it, the coldest place in Illinois was always Rockford, and that's where we were. But mm -hmm. I think after the two kids were born, we realized how fortunate we were to have family, and we wanted to be closer to family for the kids to know their grandparents. And so um, when Steve was finishing his residency, um, then we looked at, or he looked at, I went along, um, the Effingham and which would be closer for my family, and then Marshall. And um, I don't know if you looked anywhere else. And I kind of thought we were going to Effingham. I'd always heard you settle where the wife is from. But um, we came to Marshall, and I think, well, the big things were his parents and family. They were all here, and Dr. George was here. And he took Steve under his wing, and Steve could start right in. He had a mentor, you know, and it, it couldn't have worked out better. Were your parents disappointed that you didn't you land know, in Everton? I don't think so. I Maybe a little bit, but I was so much closer than I had been in Rockford or even Peoria. So, and I was in a farming community still, mm -hmm. and so that was kind of like home. So, and it was just like an hour away for them. So they came over a lot, and we would go over. So uh, it, that's been a, a, a really good decision. Oh. So I'm glad we came. Your first impression of Marshall. Now, I know you said Stewartson was a very small town, mm -hmm. and this was 3,500 probably, well, probably 3,000 about at that time. I think so. But that still seemed like, did that seem like a large city, but small compared to Rockford? Well, it... Or Belvedere? Yeah, yeah, and compared to like Peoria and East Peoria, but um, the town we would go to when I was uh, growing up would be, I guess we went to more than one, Shelbyville, because that was the county seat, okay. Effingham, that was the closest, and Mattoon. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I could tell it was smaller, but at the time Effingham wasn't that much bigger really, I don't think, than, than Marshall. I remember the courthouse, I remember walking down this, you know, the sidewalk, and there were stores everywhere. And I remember Steve and I looked in the window at, at the jewelry store, because at the time, that was over Christmas, and we had gotten engaged. We hadn't, he hadn't chosen the ring yet, and so we looked there, and I remember thinking, wow, you know, this is such a big step. <laughs> um, but, um, like I said, we got married in 76, the kids, Chris was 78, and Meg 79, and so we did decide to come back to Marshall. And um, like I said, Dr. George took us under his wing and Millie was so kind. I remember when Steve first came, they had a reception at the medical center to introduce Steve. Oh, yeah. And I believe Ruth Deal um, served like the cake and punch and Rita Tarble. So it was probably a board of directors' wives that did that. And I didn't know anybody at the time, but I, looking back, I remember certain faces so I could put them together. Um, and when we came here, we lived on 40, old 40, um, not too far from Lawrence's. Um, okay. Um, let's see, what would it be near? Across from Charlie Rose. Mm -hmm. And lived there from 79 to 86 and our house was a cute house it was you know well built but with three little ones <laughs> being on the highway was that was not the place to be 
each one of them at one time went out into the road. Um, Chris got away and yeah, Chris a followed a dog across the highway to, to Eric Rose, which was Charlie and Llewellyn's boy. It was like a split second, you know. And then Megan, she went out and was it Georgia Kennedy? Mm-hmm. She had a bright yellow suit, like play suit thing on in, in the summer. She saw the streak of yellow and she stopped. She we were at our house. Alice was there. Each of us thought she was, one was in the backyard, one was in the front, and one was in the house. We all thought the other one had, um, so it didn't mm. sound like a very good mother. Um, but <laughs> to this day, whenever I see her, uh, Georgia, I always think, you know, if not for you. Um, Georgia. Canada. Kennedy. I think her. And I think her. Kenny's her brother. Oh. She's an older sister to Kenny. Okay. Kenny and Paul. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then Maria went out. She got part way. She danced on the edge of the, the road. <laughs> and Chris and Meg knew they weren't to go to the road, but I guess they didn't know to bring their sister back. Um, so I think about that. I said to Steve, we really, you know, this, we really need to move. Um, An angel looking over you, though, that's or the right. kids we, did. We the really day. did. And um, we bought this house in 86, and Neil and Grace Hollenbeck had built it which would have been John Hollenbeck's, well, uncle, yeah, uncle. uncle but I think John's father was John uh-huh. also. Um, they had been the only people to live here. And I think soon after they, they built the house, he was killed in a car accident. So That's pretty right. much she was the only one who had really lived here. I remember when we came to look at it, we went upstairs, and the kids were with us, and the girls saw, like, a mink stole laying on the bed. They thought the mink stole came with the house, and they were so excited. Um, but it didn't. <laughs> it, yeah, it did not come with the house. <laughs> so um, we did buy um, some of the furniture from when they had her sale. In fact, that chair over there um, in the corner we bought, and um, that chair Omer T. gave us. And so... Um, a lot of the, the pieces here have a story. She was a very gracious, a gracious I, person. That's what I've heard. I mm-hmm. never We didn't met. know her real well, but yeah. she used to walk a lot. Did she, And I think, did she like flowers and yes. birds? And uh, lots of times working out in the yard or something, and she's walking by, she don't yeah. stop and chat this a while. I think Clarine Illis was a good mm-hmm. friend, and she was yes, through she the was. alley. Um, in fact, she gave us a picture of this house that Kate Mealing had painted that oh, yes. was Grace's, and Grace had given to Clarine, and then she gave it back to us, which was really oh, nice. nice to have that. Yes. I still am hoping someday to run across, through somebody, a photograph of Neil and Grace. But I've, I've asked, I haven't found one. I need to go to the genealogical library and see if there's anything there. I just had you checked like, with uh, John Hollenbeck? Mm-hmm. Okay. A couple of times, and he didn't. He would be the first person that I think yeah. might have one. and that's what I thought. But maybe someday I'll hmm. figure out a different way to, a different person Someone to may have with. one in yeah. a closet shelf or in a bookcase. Yeah, case and I run it across it, yeah. Um, so this place here at, on 8th Street, it was, I would say, the best place for the kids to grow up. Across the street we had... Cack and Jody Ferris, and they had Allison and Johnny and Andrew, a babysitter for the girls, uh. and um, best friends for Chris, and then Jeff and Susan Comerford were across the street, and they had Clark, Chris's age, Mr. and Mrs. McNary were next door, okay. and um, Omer T, kind of behind us, Bill and Bernice Tingley, and Clarine, Judy Rhodes, I mean, just like... It was just the greatest place to play. The kids would go behind Ferris's and Comerford's. It was Nellie Bennett's yard, mm-hmm. and they would have wiffle ball games all summer long. So they were they were really good. Um, so that was a good thing. And um, the Yargus girls were just over street and down. So they all had friends and walked places and rode their bikes and kind of the way I grew up, I think. And you um, felt a little more comfortable. Too. Yes. Um, now I don't know that you'd do that, just have kids you know, go out and ride, but, but they did, and um, they had lots of fun. The kids were all lifeguards 
either in Marshall or at Casey, so they enjoyed the water. Um, in the summer, a couple summers I did, was in charge of Han Clark County Handicap Camp, and I think then in, after we had moved here in 88, I went back to teaching in the fall, mm. and I, I had been doing like preschool screening and some subbing, um, but while the kids were little, I was at each child's room mother at one time, and then they all went to the Marshall Cooperative Preschool, which was the old Scout mm -hmm. building, which is now Food and Clothing Bank, mm -hmm. and with it being a cooperative, then the teacher would be there and each week it would be a different parent that would volunteer and you'd bring the the snack and so that was fun like to see how the kids interacted and and they got to socialize and learn things and and I got to stay kind of in touch with what was going on. Wills, were those all preschool students then at the mm -hmm. Scout And um, when Chris he went as a I guess it would have been the three-year-old and the four-year-olds. They had a, a oh. morning class would be the younger ones, the three-year-olds okay. kind of, I guess it would have been threes and fours. I didn't realize it had gone down to that. Well, I think threes and fours level. because the next year would have been the fours Fourth. and fives, and then you would go to kindergarten at five. So when Chris was in the second year of preschool, he would have been in the afternoon, and Meg was the morning. <laughs> And so they said it would be okay for Megan to go in the afternoon. So I took, <laughs> otherwise I would have been taking, picking up, taking, oh, yeah. picking up. So, And then um, I think the teachers, Chris and Meg, both had Carol Halloran. And oh, then yeah. um, when Maria went, she was, was born in um, 81. And so she had Pam Ogle and Lisa Belts Gentry. But I guess going back, when we moved here in... 79 then Maria was born in 81 and she was born at Union Hospital and her doctor was Dr. Naruzi and that was back when they had the the railroad track and you would sometimes you know you get railroaded I guess they called it and frequently yeah and I remember um, I had in my head that if it was your third child you would go early and which that is not true I went 10 days late and so um, but Steve, we, we went to the hospital, and it, it was almost time to deliver, and the nurses told Steve, um, go ahead and, and gown up. You may be delivering this baby. And I thought, no, he's my Lamaze coach. And Dr. Maruzi came in um, just about 10 minutes before she was born, and he said, he caught Maria, and he said, now I can make my son's birthday party. So... I guess his son had the same birthday, so. Um, I guess I didn't think yeah, about that. But, but I thought, oh. I understood why I wanted to go back for it, but well, I, sure. I thought, well, gee, his son's the But he, he made it on time, and Steve <laughs> didn't have to deliver. He was my coach, and, and all went well. Um, but I do, I remember that thinking. I thought it would go sooner and faster, and it, it didn't. But um, so then when the kids were in school, then in 88, when they were all in, in school. Then I went back to teaching and taught fifth grade for one year while um, Linda Stevens was on a sabbatical. She went to school, mm. back to school too, and then took some summer classes um, for special education for um, learning disabilities with Joyce Lewis and then um, got to teach here. And I was in the junior high and traveled and had... I'd had at one time I was had been at South North Junior High and the high school through the years. Like it would be like maybe Junior High and North one year, but the numbers were getting bigger. And by the time oh, I okay. in the last few years I was just at North, which was kind of nice not to travel, but it was also nice working with different ages and and different teachers and different. Um, buildings. Was there any time in that period that there was classes at the Ohio building, which is now the administration No, office? but I did have class in the old girls' gym. Oh. I was um, okay. in the upstairs when that building is now gone. When I was right. there, um, high school kids had driver's ed in the basement of the girls' gym, 
and art. And the upstairs, the first room, part of the time it was LD, and part of, and like in the morning maybe it was social studies, and then in the long room in the back was study hall. Yeah. Okay. Um, but that's all gone now. Um, but I remember um, at the time it, it, they needed to redo um, part of that. <laughs> but it was kind of a neat old building. Um, then, like I said, I finished the last years were all at North and mostly with um, fifth grade. I had, for several years, I had fifth and sixth. Um, taught, I think, the whole time just about with Joyce, and she's become a good friend. Um, and the kids had wonderful teachers. They all enjoyed kindergarten. So Chris and Meg had Linda Stevens, and we had Carol Halloran. They had Cheryl Marguson and Vicki Meehan, and Chris had Daryl Lee Smith. And um, then they, they had great teachers throughout. Um, they, Chris graduated and went to Eastern and became a teacher. And he teaches in Palestine. He's married to Melissa Schweitzer, and they have two little girls, oh, Zaley and Sydney. And um, Megan went to Milliken, and um, she taught in Mount Zion. Well, she taught one year in Forsyth and then Mount Zion. Met her husband, who was from Blue Mound, which is near Decatur. She taught for a while, and then in the second child was born, then she retired, and they have four little ones, um, Emma, Isabel, Olivia, and William. So we have six grandchildren, and then Maria had lived here and in an apartment, and um, she passed away in December of 14, which we love her and miss her every day. Yep, too. Um, when did you actually retire then? Um, I gr retired, I guess it would have been like maybe May 31st um, of 14. So I had actually started okay. teaching in 1974, and 40 years later, I finished teaching. I mean, there was a break in there, staying home with the kids, but I remember talking to Fred Idle, and he said um, something about, wow, that was 40 years ago, and I thought, it was. <laughs> so, and he, that's someone else that I would want to mention, that, you know, there are people that touch your lives and that are just so kind and make you feel really welcome. Mm, Dr. George and Millie, and Omer T. and Jenny, um, Isabel McCourt was such an influence, and Fred Idle, old Fred, he would come by and he would bring us bread. Oh, he would make it, he would bring it, a, a plate with it to keep the plate, and oh, he was just so sweet. And um, But Isabel, she was kind of like an adoptive grandmother. She would uh, come for May Day, which we did as a little girl, and she still did that kids today, I don't know if they know about that, but she would ring our back door and she would have made paper cones with the flowers mm. in them. She would have little jars of jelly and she would have made them cookies. And so she was, they loved going down there and she lived on, would have been South Fifth, kind of near mm -hmm. the Lewis home, Jack and Elsie yeah. Lewis, Janice Marsh's house. And oh, we would go to visit and Maria would excuse herself and go to Isabel's bathroom and she would come out and she would smell so lovely. She had to try all of Isabel's perfumes in the But I mean, we all kind of figured out that's what she was doing. She would come out and it was like, wow. Um, but she would have stories and she was just so sweet. Um, but uh, Isabel liked to cook and she did. bake, I think. Yeah, and, and she would, we would go down there and she would always have something pretty to show us or something to tell us. Mm -hmm. And Steve, I know, well, he and I both did, just enjoyed listening to Dr. George's stories. And um, Steve would 
you know, they would go back and forth to meetings and just at the office. And um, then he and, and Omer T. enjoy visiting because of the kind of West Union connection, yeah. I think. Um, I didn't get to know Millie as well as I, I wish I could have. Um, but she was a sweet person. And, and her background student. was nursing, too. Yes, yes. Yeah, she had been a head neurosurgical nurse mm -hmm. at, at Methodist Hospital with George mm -hmm. Day's training. I think one of your questions was about um, how did you choose your career? And I think that my mother was a teacher, my aunt, my two uncles. And at the time growing up in the 60s and 70s, I think you thought nurse, teacher, secretary. Yeah. I don't think I thought beyond that. And I did, after I finished at Lake Paul Custard Stand, when I turned 16, <laughs> I got a, a job with minimum wage and I worked, took a nurse's aid class and did that on weekends and in the summers and even part of college, I w would go back to St. Anthony Hospital in Effingham and do that. And I remember thinking that that's such a life and death. <laughs> and I thought with teaching, if I showed them something wrong, I could show them the next way, the right way. And I thought, um, and I just, I liked being with kids. So. You didn't think you wanted to run a restaurant then or an uh, no. ice cream stand? <laughs> no. My, in fact, my grandfather had a restaurant. My other grandfather was a <laughs> farmer. So, but no, you know, Steve's mother could have run a restaurant. She was a fabulous cook. Mm -hmm. And his sisters cooked just the same way. Yeah, it's very, very good. The kids would love going down there in the summers. On the weekends, there was always something to keep them busy outside. And Steve's mom enjoyed having family get-togethers and picnics and and all kinds of things down there. So being here was good for the kids. They had lots oh, of yeah. cousins. And then getting to know the community. And I think um, when I first came, I am not sure how we first met Isabel, but she took me to a, a DAR meeting and my aunt had done all the research. And so I was able to go into DAR a lot quicker because she had done a lot of the mm -hmm. background so I just could match up. And I remember the first DAR meeting I think I went to was at Elsie Lou Huffington's and Isabel took me and I was expecting Maria. So, 1980. Isabel, when she first was married, lived down near my parents, near West Union. And they were never able to have children. Mm -hmm. And she was also a good friend of my aunt, uh, Norma Mackie Miller. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, that lived on, in the same neighborhood at that time. And uh, so, uh, so she kind of had ties with us uh, a bit. I think Isabel was <clears throat> one of the founding members of the Historical Society, too, I believe. Be. She, she and was, was instrumental in helping us start the, uh, the museum, I think. Well, I was going to say, because that's one of my good memories, is um, okay. that she would do the Historical Museum, and they would, do, would be open on Sunday afternoons in the summer, and they would have lemonade and cookies, mm -hmm. and we would go down there, because she would tell us about it, um, but then when they had the sesquicentennial, which was in 1985, mm -hmm. she was in charge of the big style show. And it was at the Legion. And she knew people, knew clothes. Yeah. She had it all put together, had the narration. I kind of think Rhett Smitley was um, narrated. And I remember um, each of the kids, they were in the style show and even, and I was. I. Remember, she had this great big <laughs> floppy brimmed hat. beaver hat that I wore that was so hot, and it was a neat black outfit. And then I wore a dress that belonged to Opal Masoner, who lived on Route One. Mm -hmm. yeah. She had been, her husband had been in Washington D.C. somehow in the government, and it was like a Jackie Kennedy dress, and I thought that was great. And then one that was blue Chantilly lace because Jenny Hickenbotham and um, Jack Huffington's granddaughter, Candace Collins. Okay. And, and then I, 
Isabel took us to the TV station with Kevin Orper, and we got to be on the noon show. Um, I, I remember that. But then um, the kids were in it, and Chris <laughs> wore my brother's 1950s Roy Rogers suede <laughs> French jacket and his Roy Rogers shirt and cowboy boots and cowboy hat, and Maria wore a dress of mine from the 50s, and Megan wore my aunt Shirley Temple dress from like about 1939 or so, and then she wore one <laughs> that belonged to, I think it was Martha Buckner, and we have pictures of all that and things from the style show, but that was Isabel's thing, and she did a style show, and the kids were in it did at the nursing, at the nursing home. home. Yes, and your folks came in mm -hmm. for that, and she did one at our church. She was always, that was, I think, one of the things she really enjoyed and was really yeah. good at. Um, and then that same year that they had the sesquicentennial style show, we had the house walk, and that's the one I worked on. Um, i trying to think who all, let's see, were you on that one? It was... John and Sarah Tarble and Peggy yeah. Hudson. Um, I think that was the same time we were it on was tour in '85. Yes, and mm -hmm. and um, there's a gentleman that came down from Vermilion, Illinois, to give Joe us Joe Sanders. Yeah, and to give us like historical background mm -hmm. on the homes and help us describe them for the the brochure. Um, I remember that parade was really big. Uh, it was neat and. The Antique Study Club, that's a group that Isabel did start. Heard of them. <laughs> and, yeah. And um, so she had started that, and it's still going, and I'm st still in it. Um, and that's a fun thing, because you learn something each meeting. Uh, somebody does a lesson. Um, through DAR, then I've also, but not actively, a, a Mayflower Society, where you can go back to the Mayflower um, at one time, we belonged to um, the Historical Society, and I don't know, I think we back are again. <laughs> um, the library and Marshall Main Street, when it was first getting started with Pat McCam, and um, I remember Ann and Harley Bennett and Pat McCammon and I were in, I, I think Ann made the chili, but it was one of the ch first chili cook-offs. And it was right before the Jazz Age Chautauqua that came. Yeah. So that was our theme. And we worked on the, the Chautauqua for the Jazz Age and the Civil War one. And then I think, I think it was Jackie Kitchen and Peggy Morris did the style show that we did. Um, they were. For one, I think it was the Jazz Age because Carol Arney had all these dresses that belonged to her aunt. And um, Megan wore one of Carol's, and I did. And Maria wore the neatest outfit. It was Connie Richardson's husband's parachute, made into like a negligee kind of mm -hmm. with a. It was so pretty, and it was silky. Um, but that was Connie's. Connie was in the military. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it was her. It was, it was her parachute rather than her husband's. Well. It was a parachute. It was given to her, I believe. Okay. Okay. Because she was in the military, and I had interviewed her, and she talked about that. Oh, okay. That was, and we have pictures. That was a neat <laughs> thing. Um, I just thought that had such a neat story with it. Yeah. Um, so, I guess uh, somewhere it mentions um, hobbies and interests, and I think history, genealogy, um, antiques and reading, but most of all family. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I enjoy reading things and my mother's cousin, she has done more research and found that we were, on her side, were related to Teddy Roosevelt and George Custer and mm -hmm. Sally Rand. So all kinds of people in the history. Uh, Let's see, I, I guess as far as jobs and careers, um, again, it would be the teaching has always been, you know, the number one and um, outside the home, that is. The Dairy Queen and the <laughs> Custard Stand and the Nurse's Aid, but um, teaching, about being a mother 
and why that was the most important and still is, and grandmother. Um, I guess the major influence was, I guess that would be in family, the work ethic of my parents oh, yeah. and the grandparents. Um, as far as when we came here, again, it would be, you know, George and Millie and and over to you and Jenny and Isabel and Fred, like people that, that befriended us. I think you've kind of answered it, but one thing that was running through my mind, and I did want to ask you as a newcomer to the community, mm -hmm. here you were from far away from here, you came in here as a new resident, were you made feel welcome? Yes, and um, I wanted to get to know people, and that's kind of okay. been something with, you know, joining and trying to do that and getting to know people and Steve's family was here and like his sister-in-law Eleanor knew mm -hmm. so many people and through our church the first Methodist church and going there um, from when we first came here his um, brother Ken has gone there and Eleanor the whole life and um, John and Patty go there and now Joe and Alice Schroeder go there. Um, Steve grew up at the Brick Church down mm -hmm. by West Union, but, but we were in town, and when we first started going to church, um, we would come in the 7th Street door, which mm -hmm. they don't use that much anymore. But George, Dr. George would always take the back pew so he could leave if he got called out or slip in if he was late. And so we started sitting with Dr. George, and often someone would come from the back of the church and tap Steve or tap Dr. George. That doesn't happen anymore. And Steve and I, um, we get up early enough, we have good intentions, and all of a sudden the time's gone and we're slipping in. So now we don't have a pew. <laughs> we just sit wherever and sit with Chris and Melissa and the girls and near the Mackeys. Someone had told me this. I don't know it for a real fact, but... Dr. George was very possessive of his pew. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if some stranger came in and sat there, mm -hmm. he would simply ask him to move. Now, I don't know if he asked him to move, but <laughs> as long as, as I knew him, and as long as he went to church, that, that back pew was his. But I remember many times where, Steve, you'd hear the phone ring in the back, mm -hmm. and then pretty soon someone would come and tap um, Dr. George or Steve, and they would get up. We often went to church in two cars. Oh, yeah. Um, we, I would take the kids, and I remember one Sunday, little kids, you know, you wanted them in church, you wanted them to listen, and, and they were kind of under the pew and kind of wiggly and looking around, and, and I just thought, oh, you know, I wanted them to behave. And, and when church was over, Harley Bennett said to me, Beth, you're the only one who noticed. And so I th thought, I guess that now I can look around and smile. Don't worry about the smalls. Though. Yeah. <laughs> Does uh, the, the fact that I guess maybe elaborate a little bit more on being a doctor's wife. Obviously, the doctor is on call many times. And, and, and you've indicated even at church he had to leave. Somebody. And it has changed. Um when we first came, he would be on call and the phone would ring all night. And you know how people would say, you know, a call in the middle of the night would just scare them? Mm -hmm. It was so much a part of, of our lives that, you know, I didn't worry with the phone call in the middle of the night. Um, I think I usually woke up when I heard it, but um, after a while I, I probably didn't so much. <laughs> but Often our Sundays we would go to Sunday school and church, and Sunday school then was first, then church, I think. And then we would go and help Steve make rounds at Union Hospital, hmm, really? the kids and I would. And I'm sure we were really good at He would take us to the doctor's lounge where the TV was. We would get something out of a machine, and we would sit there and watch TV and wiggle and giggle, and, and he would make his rounds, and he'd come back and get us. And... Um, we would either have gone to lunch before or after, so that was kind of our Routine. Sunday thing. 
Uh, now our Sunday thing is um, to go to church and Sunday school. And Sunday school's after. And then the Mackies go out for lunch, I would say, almost every Sunday. Either in Marshall or someplace else. But there's usually like eight or ten of us. And sometimes um, Ken's kids come. Sometimes our Chris comes, you know. And it's just... We still, those are our best friends, I think, are his family. Well, so You're close enough you can do that. Yes, and it, you would think we'd run out of things to talk about, and we still don't. <laughs> so well, I remember talking to Dr. George, and of course he was at Rotary, and lots of times I just chatted with him and all. But I can remember him telling about, especially in more of his earlier medical years, that so many times they would sit down for dinner, the phone would ring, and suddenly he was gone. Or they had planned to go somewhere, and the last minute, he was called out. And that's... Yeah. So that type of routine would be very difficult, I think, to adjust to. The kids got to where they could answer the phone and they could take a, a good message. They would, <laughs> you know, Mackie residents, um, oh, and they would ask for Steve, may I take a message? I will get a hold of him. That was before cell phones, mm -hmm. but they could do that. He did the emergency room when it was in the lower level of the Cork Perfect. Medical Center. Mm -hmm. So he was always going out um, in the middle of a meal or something. Oh, I remember um, Dr. George would tell that he had would have ladies in labor in two hospitals. And when <laughs> it was Megan's senior night where the parents walk out with their, you know, basketball player or cheerleader, you know, and they, you know, honor them, you know, by reading their name and things. Um, but Steve had somebody in labor. So I walked out with her, and he got there before, you know, the evening was over, but not okay. soon enough. But the kids, you know, that was part of growing up, and they were proud of him for what he was oh, doing. And I'm sure there were times we were disappointed he wasn't there, you know, but um, we were glad, you know, of what he was doing. So um, that was nice. So um, I guess there's... I think a special pride, you know, in being married to a doctor because he's helping. Mm -hmm. And I think that as a teacher, you want to help too. And I think that's kind of, hopefully that's what we're doing, you know. And Steve's still doing that in Clinton. Um, and I guess I'm helping in different ways. Children, grandchildren, and my mother, my sister, so just... Um, you mentioned your mother. Does she live alone in Stewartson, um, or does she, she live with your sister? In 1981, 1982, they moved to Effingham. And my father stayed in the bank. Mm -hmm. My mother retired from teaching, and my older brother bought their house, I guess. Oh. And so the house is still in the family, um, and he stayed in Stewartson. And he does the farming and the insurance. And... So my folks were there, and my mom fell in October mm. of 13. So as her hip healed, she moved to the villas of Hollybrook in Effingham. Okay. So it's assisted living, mm -hmm. I guess, if yeah. independent. But she's still very, very sharp. Um, Great. So um, that, that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, Is there someone in your total lifetime that has really influenced you in your thinking or in your career or your philosophies? There are probably several. And and the people I've mentioned, I think my parents, my mom and dad grew up during the Depression. So they were, you know... If it happens, you know, you just make the best of it and keep going. And um, Steve's mom was very, you know, loving. And and so I guess just like the family. I've had some really good friends still do here. And when we lost Maria, um, people have been so, so kind. Um I don't know that there was just one person. There were many. Because really, you've mentioned several people here yeah. that uh, um, have been a, a big support and a part of your life. 
Yes, and I think that Marshall was welcoming and I think I want to feel a part of Marshall. So I always tried to make the connection, like who's related to whom <laughs> and where did Solomon live and who are their siblings and, you know, try to get it all connected so that, and that's really helped because I feel like this is my home, you know. And in a small town, yes. there's so many interrelated You don't know yeah. who's related to who sometimes right. when you first start. But I think I'm showing my age because, <laughs> you know, with the students <laughs> I've had, then uh -huh. towards the end I, they would say a name and I think, okay, well, tell me who your parents are. Your grandparents, oh. you know, like you're starting to mm -hmm. connect that way. <laughs> I um, know. When I go somewhere, I'll say, okay, well, if I'm looking for landmarks, tell me what was in that building before. So, so I guess I'm showing my age, but um, you know, just the and the library. But I also, I guess, when we're talking about things I like, I enjoy art, like kind of. Mm -hmm. um, I I keep thinking I'm going to sign up for classes at the Gaslight, um, and I still plan to. Um, they have some wonderful programs. Oh, it. I took the granddaughters there, and Joe Rich gave them a little okay. lesson on a on a day, and and they had so much fun. I thought, oh, I would like to do that too. <laughs> so I would like to. You do can do that. that when you retire. Yeah, right. That's right. That's right. Um, let's see. I'm just trying to think if there was anything else that that you had on your list. Is there a particular, uh, I guess you'd say, historical event or something in in the world or the United States or some political um, situations? really impacted you? I think where I grew up, I wasn't aware of a lot of things going on. Um, I mean, I I was at the tail end of Vietnam, and I had a friend, though, who was to mm. go. He thought he would go. He had a number where he was going to go, and he enlisted. And he probably wouldn't have been called, but he didn't know. But I remember my brother had a number that would have been called, and my mother yeah. kept saying to him, study, keep your grades up in college, study, study, study. Um, and that sounds like I, my daughter-in-law is in the Guard, and she's been in Kuwait, Afghanistan, I think United Arab Republic. So I am so proud of her for doing that, but it's... I guess as a mother, you're kind of selfish. You don't want your child to go. Yeah. So um, she's uh, um, almost has 20 years in the guard. So, oh so my. you know, you you are so proud of people who do that. But I really probably didn't know a lot mm. of what was going on in in civil rights. I I didn't until I kind of got to college. Well, I grew up in a period even before you, and what happened in the world or even in town. You didn't know instantly like you do today. Right. It was a delayed thing. Mm -hmm. And again, I guess out here in Clark County, uh, things that happened on the other side of the globe, you saw it in a newsreel at the theater or read in a newspaper. But I think I'm like everybody else, though, that I could tell you exactly where I was when we found out John Kennedy had been assassinated. We mm -hmm. didn't have, I guess there must have been a radio in our school because my <laughs> mother, we grew up, we were living next door to the school. And she called the school to let them know in the office. And they told us in our classrooms, somehow there was a radio that we could listen to. It was a big two-story old brick building. And they tore it down. But um, I remember that. And I remember then not going to school. Like, they canceled school, mm -hmm. and you could watch the funeral. But on a Sunday was when um, Lee Harvey Oswald was killed. We were all in church, but a friend's father wasn't, and he watched it on live TV. Um, when I was in college at Eastern, they had in the newspaper, and the talk around college was to go to this, um, I guess you'd call it an assembly at mm -hmm. Lance Gym, because Gerald Ford was coming, and they oh. said someday he might be president, because that was just... Spiro Agnew was kind of in trouble, mm -hmm. just starting, and they were so right, and we all went. And that was like a really big thing because it wasn't that many yeah. months later that 
Nixon, <laughs> you know, then, um, and Gerald Ford was the president then. And so that was kind of neat to know that you were there right before, uh, when I was at Eastern, was at in the early 70s, that was when streaking was, I, you know, like, I lived off campus in a sorority house, and so, <laughs> but the yearbook that year, <laughs> You know, that, I guess, and that made national news. So that, that was, I guess that dates really um, me. But um, I would say, I guess the, the John Kennedy thing. Okay. That's... Because then you realized, or I did, like history, how important, you know, and that fascination with history and, and presidents. And I think... You know, just reading all I can read about about that. And he was such a dynamic person. Too. He was. He had a magnet about him that mm -hmm. attracted people and their uh, I think that youth feelings. Yeah. yeah, and it seemed more kind of the age of your parents or something. And Lincoln, though, is still my favorite president. But I and I think it's all that you know the Illinois and he was such a wise man. But there's something about that that Camelot era, even mm -hmm. just to read about it. Um, so. But what you said I think is true, and you see it in the print and articles all the time, that just about everyone remembers mm -hmm. where they were and what they were doing mm -hmm. when they learned about that. And I also remember when John Lennon was shot, it came over the radio. And I remember when Princess Diana was killed. It, it, yeah. There are certain things, I guess, but the John Kennedy I really, really remember that. Um, We've all got so many modern things around our house. Mm -hmm. Beth, is there something that's a modern convenience you say, I just couldn't live without that? Modern as in my lifetime? Okay, as in my lifetime. Gee. Um, this sounds terrible. Cell phones. I love staying in <laughs> touch with family children, friends, Steve, you know, just knowing mm -hmm. that um, I never thought I would be that, but it's so nice to, to know that you're just a phone call away. And um, I remember when we first got our first cell phone, <laughs> and it was in the car, and it was this thing that sat on the, the hump yeah, thing there, a uh, uh, bag thing. Things, yes, yeah. and I remember thinking, and I remember people talking about getting a microwave and how I thought, oh, we don't really need one, you know. We do. Uh, when you're without a washer or a dryer, just for a day or two, or a dishwasher, you think, wow, air conditioning, I don't know. I think probably that this cell phone is probably just... Well, you mentioned that when you were talking about Steve. When there was no contact, even before pagers and that kind of mm -hmm. thing, the only contact was a phone somewhere, a landline phone, and then someone relaying a message. Yeah. I mean, I remember calling like to Tom's restaurant or the col oh, yeah. Colonial Kitchen if Steve had gone out there to get a hold of him, mm -hmm. you know. But now you can't find phone numbers. They're not in the phone book. Everybody's on a cell phone. So I guess my good is also can be a bad, <laughs> but... Um, I guess I didn't hesitate in those days to call a restaurant and they'd go oh, and see if he's there um, and, and call him to the phone. It was just part of the way of life. It was. It was. Beth, if you were in, say, in Europe somewhere and someone was talking to you and you said, I'm from Marshall, I'd say, Marshall? Mm -hmm. Well, where's that and what's that all about? What would you tell them about our community and maybe why they might want to visit here? I think I would say that it's a charming, like, old-fashioned historical town, friendly, good schools, wonderful people, a great place to raise a family. And it's, um, I guess for young people, it's close enough to somewhere, um, and there are things to do. I love the Friday night band concerts on the courthouse lawn. The grandchildren love to go up there. Um, 
Steve and I do, you know, take the lawn chair and sit, the ice cream socials. Um, I know like when we did the Marshall Main Street and we did like All American Night and we do the oh, yeah. games and now they do the, lim we did I think the Lemonade Thanks, Stand yeah. contest and it's still going and that they have, um, you know, refurbished um, Harlan Hall and, and they're bringing back, you know, the buildings and rather than tearing them down, I like that. Well, Beth, it's been a real pleasure visiting with you. And you have really, I think, given a good image of Marshall. And especially, it's important because you didn't grow up here. Thank but you. you have been here long enough that it's now home. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you feel that way. Thank you. It's been a delight visiting with you. And I want to thank you for your time uh, and so your input. I enjoyed visiting with you.